I am honored to introduce our next doctor, Dr. Harsh. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, today we're going to be ta talking about a really, really important topic. But before we start, can you talk to those that are watching um, a little bit about your background and your history and where your office is located? All right. The second question is the easy one. I'm located in New Orleans, a suburb of New Orleans, but then I, I work at the University of New Orleans also. And the how this happened and, and my background, uh, I started in general surgery, had a very bad car accident in my training period took a medical leave, um, had to make a living, and ended up in emergency medicine, and then uh, got an invitation to apply for a job in New Orleans while I was living in Denver. Uh, came down there, I got involved in an emergency medicine hospital group, and we were the diving and hyperbaric medicine treatment center for the Gulf of Mexico, Central, and South Central United States for diving accidents. Uh, and I was new to diving hyperbaric medicine and started asking questions on something that really perplexed me, which was why our divers with brain decompression sickness were not getting cured like the U.S. Navy predicted they should. And one thing led to the next, and I, I made a discovery with my senior partner that we could treat this chronic brain decompression sickness in divers. And simultaneously, we looked at it in Louisiana boxers. And then the first cerebral palsy children, the first autistic children, the first, you know, pediatric and neurological diagnoses uh, in maybe 90 different conditions. Wow. So, and it just kind of, I, I stood up and said, wow, look, this work. And then people uh, demanded that I prove it. And so we had to do some studies and it's kind of where we are today, but at the heart of it all, I was a clinical doctor who just was observing and asking some questions and uh, some amazing cases came my way and I took a swing at them and did something different. Now, so. what do you think the relation between autism and hyperbarics is? Obviously, you, you saw some well, cases early on. It, and the answer to that is in how I treated these first autistic cases. And, and unbeknownst to me, the first one, the child that I know that was treated uh, was published a year before I started treatment on what I thought was the first child with autism treated with hyperbaric oxygen. And he was uh, a grandson of a radiologist in Florida who had the idea to try hyperbaric oxygen. The child improved and he published it. Well, after those initial divers and Louisiana boxers, we had a formal study to look at any brain-based neurological condition, chronic condition old ones. So they had long since stopped improving. And in the process, in the decade of doing that and looking at a single dose of hyperbaric oxygen, the first autistic child got referred. And he'd been misdiagnosed as cerebral palsy and developmental delay. But he was on the, at that time, uh, the uh, CARS was the diagnostic tool. So the childhood autism rating scale, I think the threshold was 30 or above. He was a 29. What so year was that? That was 1995. Okay. And I, I actually published the case in my book uh, years later, in 2007. Um, but he was a birth-injured child. This was not a regressive autism. There was a clear-cut, unequivocal injury at birth. And they'd given him this diagnosis of cerebral palsy and developmental delay and so on. And so he got referred for that, but with a CARS score of 29 and all the autistic features. So today he'd be clearly on that spectrum, you know, the autism spectrum. And I treated this child and lo and behold, all the autism features improved. And next thing you know, there was another case, another case. And by the late 90s, I had, oh, I don't know, uh, nine, 10 children that I had treated and we had seen improvement with. And so from my standpoint, we were looking at autism, I knew nothing about it really, as a potential another, another wounding condition of the brain. So in 2001, when Dan Burton's Oversight Committee invited me to come and present this evidence, it was the first year they were actually looking at treatment, not cause. And they wanted to know what people were doing. And, uh, the other person there testifying to me was 
testifying about chelation therapy for autism. And I said, well, look, I, I just have to say that so far, the great majority of the autistic cases I have treated are not mercury related. They were all birth injured cases. And it, it got to the concept of, well, what is any neurological condition? The condition results from the combination of brain areas that are injured. And in autism, it turns out the dominant injury is to temporal lobes and somewhat frontal lobes. So here I was seeing, now I've got, of course, a whole bunch of children who were the regressive form and who were maybe vaccine related and all sorts of other causes. But in the end, it is a wounding process to the brain of, in some cases, unknown cause. In other cases, we do know the cause. And so it fit in this, it just was another one of the injury diagnoses that we were treating. And that's how this all happened for me. It's not a psychiatric diagnosis. And when people ask me to, you know, prepare a lecture on autism and hyperbaric oxygen, I went through all of the data, just overwhelming, uh, you know, uh, brain size, biopsies of brain tissue, et cetera, et cetera, showing this is a biological condition unequivocally. And that is why you're seeing hyperbaric help with that, because if exactly. it was a psychologist, if it was just something in our psyche, it would be so much different of a treatment. This wouldn't even be working, correct? Exactly. It even gets to the whole root of psychiatric illness and the perception that it's always been psychiatric and functional, when in fact we're now finding it is due to underlying metabolic, vascular causes, birth injury, all sorts of different things. And autism really is, is the feature diagnosis of a inappropriate psychiatric, uh, you know, heading. And when you talk about, in the beginning, you talked about, you know, birth injury or, you know, trauma at birth of some sort, but now then later you talked about how there's so many different subgroups, you know, yes. that are coming to your practice now. So why is it helping those subgroups, whether they a vaccine injury or, uh, you know, That's whatever injury, question. you know? Great question. Uh, well, look at these other causes. Let's say uh, you have regressive autism and it in fact begins right after a vaccine administration of 15 or 18 months. What is the underlying pathology there? Well, we know there's heavy metals that are potentially involved, but it is a neuroinflammatory condition. What is inflammation? It is a wound process, or I should say <clears throat> it is the reaction of the body to wounding. But in the case of systemic inflammation, the brain also can be a target. So. Why does hyperbaric oxygen work for all of this? Well, nobody has known for, what, 350 years nearly of the history of hyperbaric therapy until the last 10 years. Now we know how this works. A single hyperbaric treatment has been shown to affect gene expression of over 40% of all the protein coding genes, genes in our DNA. One single treatment turns on or turns off temporarily 8,101 of our over 19,000 protein coding genes. And the largest clusters of the turned on genes are the growth and repair hormone genes and the anti-inflammatory genes. And the, the uh, largest clusters of the turned off ones are the pro-inflammatory genes and the ones for cell death. So what we're doing is affecting a wide array of biological functions through differential gene expression, depending on the level of pressure and the level of oxygen. And that's why it seems to work for other causes of autism, along with a lot of these other neurological and other systemic diseases. Now, some people might be watching it and might be asking the question, what is hyperbaric? And many of us don't know what that is. It is the use of increased pressure and increased oxygen as drugs to treat basic disease processes and indirectly the diseases themselves. And so when you're talking about hyperbaric, you're talking about going into a chamber, which is having a dive. Yes. It could be a soft chamber or a hard chamber. Correct. And so maybe explain that to somebody who still the word chamber. I'm just thinking about when I first learned, I didn't know what they, they what they were talking about. It doesn't matter what the material constructing the chamber is, whether it's soft or it's hard, steel, acrylic, it doesn't matter. It is merely a vehicle to elevate pressure and oxygen for the whole body. So for instance, there is evidence that if you put topical oxygen with a constriction device and pressure and oxygen on a limb, there are some benefits 
uh, to the tissue underneath. But to get the systemic effects and affect genes in all the cells in our body, you have to enclose the whole body in it. And if you think of it, this is really well known. It's the way our body adapts to increased pressure and going to altitude. It's all through gene expression, the things that happen. So total body enclosure, pressure is distributed equally throughout, oxygen level is also increased, and the two of them together while you're enclosed in there are affecting the genes in your body through breathing the oxygen in, that pressurized air or oxygen in the chamber, or just the hydrostatic pressure itself is distributed throughout the body. You don't feel that. How do you know who is a candidate and who's not? A good question. Uh, and I, I don't want to, you know, hyperbarics have been confused as miracle cure is good for everything. Well, uh, possibly that may be true depending on getting the dose right for a given condition in a given person. But who is it right for? I like to say anybody who has been wounded. So anybody with a wounding process, either remote or in process. And if you think about it, then that encompasses a wide, wide range of disease. And any disease that is chronic inflammation, what is the inflammation? It is the result of the wounding process. So it is powerfully anti-inflammatory. And because of that, we can treat many chronic diseases, as you've seen and heard evidence here about. Is there any type of um, a prerequisite that you do prior to being a candidate for hyperbaric treatment? Uh, not necessarily. Although it helps to, you know, hyperbarics is one piece of the puzzle. It's a very powerful one. So, uh, I mean, you like to get, disease usually is due to a combination of factors. And while hyperbaric oxygen can treat a lot of the pathophysiology, you kind of have to do the other things to facilitate your body's uh, repair mechanisms and get yourself into good health. So, you know, nutrition and exercise and sleep and reducing stress and maybe some supplements to supplement your vitamin deficiencies and so on. And when you're working with those individuals with autism, um, is there a particular protocol or is everybody quite different in their protocols? No. And in fact, this whole idea of protocol is counter to the way that medicine is administrated. If you think of it, when you come in, you're not necessarily treated the exact same way that somebody else with your problem is. I mean, that cookbook approach, one size fits all, in the end may be one size fits no one. Uh, in fact, what medicine has traditionally been, and it's kind of now come full circle, and again, the modern words of precision medicine and personal medicine and medicine for you at this time in your injury and so on, uh, it's a matter of fitting therapies to you, your biology, your comorbidities, etc. So I don't like to say protocol because it implies this fixed approach. Uh, there's kind of an approach and an algorithm uh, in which you try, hyperbaric oxygen is a dose. You try a dose of hyperbaric therapy, like I give you an antihypertensive drug for your high blood pressure, and then you look for response. You're getting better, you're getting worse, are you having side effects or not, and you adjust as you go. So there's a range, it turns out, where you know people have published studies showing that there's been benefit. But in fact, there's a whole range here, much of which hasn't even been explored, that we're finding out. And if somebody wants to get hyperbaric treatment, how do they find a doctor like yourself? We're on the internet, and, and there are now organizations that have you know, uh, associations that are full of doctors practicing. And what I like to tell people, if you look at most chronic disease, you can't heal them in eight weeks of hyperbaric therapy or 10 weeks or three months or however long. I look at it more as uh, a reversal of the process that's going to take a while. So usually when people come to see you, you're 40 years old and you've got whatever medical problem, I ask them, did you get like that today? or yesterday? No. It's usually a history of cumulative insults. So what I try to do is dose them in a range that I can transition them eventually to either a home chamber or to get them at a facility near them that'll hopefully treat them similarly and finish it. Is it something long-term? Like you said, it's it not can be, yes. So could it be for the rest of their life? It uh, could be. Oh, yes. Sure it can. And it can be something even uh, to be used as a longevity tool. Um, 
because what is aging? Aging is DNA based. Uh, and what do we have here is a DNA therapy. And I, I was always more cautious about saying this until now I've treated in excess of 100 uh, cases of people really at the end of their life in terms of dementia uh, and cognitive decline. And this has put years back on their life. My mother is one of the best examples. I talked about my book and uh, this week published in Medical Gas Research Online Peer Reviewed Instant Access will be the first ever Alzheimer's case treated and documented with pet brain imaging. And what it shows is the greatest improvement in metabolism with pet documentation of any therapy ever delivered for Alzheimer's disease. Wow. And it's the 11th case I've treated. So, uh, you know, this is a, a treatment that can even yeah. prolong life. Okay, so it's not just for autism, it's for no, many no, other no. things. No, 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 it's not just for autism. So do you have a website? I do. What is your it's website? hbot.com. Wow, you've got hbot.com. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. for those families out there that maybe they just got the diagnosis of autism and they're sitting there and they're, I mean, it is very confusing when you go online trying to find all the different yes. things and you do feel helpless and you do feel, you do feel lost. What kind of encouragement, what words can you leave them with? There is, there's all sorts of hope. Um, and the first thing I would look for is a doctor who routinely treats uh, children with autism, number one. Uh, number two, go to the Autism Research Institute website. And I think this is the, the greatest service that has been done is over the course of, I think, six, seven years, they polled all sorts of autism families and asked the families to rate the therapies done on their children and what was most effective. It's now been taken and published in a, a formal peer-reviewed article by Dr. Dan Rosenau. And they've got them grouped biomedical therapies, behavioral therapies, etc. cetera. Uh, and look at that and you'll be able to see the therapies that other families have had success with. In the, in the biomedical therapies, hyperbaric oxygen done with all sorts of different doses, with all sorts of different people in their homes, treatment centers, wherever, was rated number five. Roughly 60% uh, claimed success with it. The highest was, I think, 73 or 75% with chelation. In my experience, uh, 80% of my patients with autism respond to hyperbaric therapy. And that actually, interestingly, I just heard this uh, yesterday, two days ago, uh, that is Dr. Rosnell's figure as well in his experience. Well, I think the biggest word is hope and that there's so yes. many resources. So I there love are. that you said that. So oh, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Harsh, for being here and helping so many families. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Really appreciate it.